Hello and welcome to this episode of Smashing the Sudoku. I'm Thomas Snyder, I also go by Dr. Sudoku, and we're really happy when you like, comment, or subscribe to support this channel out. We also love it when you send us your viewer questions. You can send those to ads, that's askdrsudoku at gmpuzzles.com. And today's question comes from George G, who asks, do you ever get writer's block as a puzzle constructor? It's an interesting question. I often get the question of how to make puzzles, and with Mike Selinker, uh, first in Games Magazine, then as its own standalone book, we wrote a story about puzzle craft, how to make every kind of puzzle. But when writing about how to make every kind of puzzle, we don't talk about when to make every kind of puzzle. And there are different times, at least in my life, when I've been more productive and certainly much less productive. Um, you don't always have the inspiration. You don't always have the new ideas. Uh, a lot of the best puzzle makers want to do something that stands out when Put onto the page and you know I've had <laughs> the extremes of having an idea that I don't yet know how to construct versus not having the right ideas to construct but there are moments when you know it clicks and when it's, it's right to, to do things and you've got to watch out for those in different ways. Uh, one thing I do sometimes is look back at other periods of my life when I've constructed puzzles. One of the reasons I actually went through this series um, to look back at the 60 puzzles I made in 2013 right after I quit a job in science and launched Grandmaster Puzzles as a and a bridging company uh, and bridging activity for a year uh, is like, you know, what was that experience? Like I hadn't written all of those styles of puzzles before, but I said, you know, in this, this period of, of 10 weeks, I was going to try to take 20 different genres. Some I knew I'd be a very good at in the Sudoku sense for sure. And others I, I would be struggling more with, including some of the logic styles I hadn't written before. And just saying, where did I have new ideas to push them forward? Could I make them interesting enough and, and use that as a way, uh, as a catalyst to grow out a website? And so that project is helping me now as I'm sort of in the midst of another puzzle writer's block and trying to figure out what's next for the site in some ways and what's next for me as I go, you know, maybe I've spent too many of the last years as a puzzle editor and not as, as much as a puzzle constructor. And so I've been tr constructing different kinds of puzzles for a bit. I've even been working recently on a, a, a multi-puzzle series and been struggling in some sense. I, 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 this weekend I had my own puzzle writer's block, which is I didn't have the right form of an idea to get the last uh, point across in a series I've been writing. And, uh, and I had all these small nuggets and they didn't work on their own. And then I st stood back from them and said, oh, after four years of searching, well, maybe you can just put them all together in a, in a hodgepodge and across them the, the solution that, that someone's meant to find will be something that they can find in their own different ways, maybe by solving two or three of the five riddles that are on this page or something else. And so it's sometimes thinking differently when you get stuck is a way to make a puzzle that might work. And so um, this is you know the end of this look back series and hopefully there'll be an exciting set of new ideas and new constructions and new things for Grandmaster Puzzles to go forward again soon. Uh, so hopefully you've been enjoying the series as we go through it and as we get to what will be now these last uh, two puzzles, Philomeno and Isodoku. Um, they're worthy puzzles to finish out this series. Philomeno is a great style and actually it's the style I put last because I hadn't really constructed it before, but I knew it was a style that has really graceful elegance if you can put in uh, all the, the number clues in the right ways. The interactions between clues are brilliant and there are a fair number of far better Philomeno constructors we've had on the site now. On the other side, the Isodoku, the snowflake geometry that, that I made with Wei Wan Wong for our Sudoku Masterpieces book is very constraining in certain places in the puzzle. I figured I could write a challenging enough example, but I, I think I'll be able to do good enough uh, going back through this. So let's get the puzzle up and let's get my video back up and let's see how uh, we get on with this. First, the squeeze play phenomenon. Uh, when I wrote this, for sure the one through five and five through one diagonal was in the top of my mind and then I was having, excuse me, these other diagonals sort of have up and down, although I see there's some like uh, different directions they go. Um, diagonally adjacent twos is always a, an easy place to start. Samaya is just going in there because they have to not touch and that puts in this two. Um, this two can't come this way because it blocks off uh, basically the two options for it so I can mark in this edge. Um, do I see anything else from that? Um, there are some constraints because of this one already here. So uh, I can't actually have this two come straight up because it forces this up and leaves behind a one polyomino. And that looks to actually be the same over here. If I, if I put that two in, I'm gonna leave this isolated. So I can mark in this edge and mark in this edge. And on the top, that's a little more useful because it closes off this uh, shape already. The three right next to it now can take 
well, you might think it could take one above, but it will always have to take this cell or this cell, and that will join it with this other three. So we know that this three is going to be joining these two givens with one more cell, and it's going to leave a one uh, hidden polyonal up top. Let's see, uh, this two, I think I've got one more thing I can mark off of it because I can't sort of have it come down and leave behind two cells. So I have this edge marked off. And so I think this looks like a good start to this corner. And the main thing that I sometimes think of, and for sure this is probably in my mind when I construct this puzzle, is a one near a two is a good place to seed hidden polyominoes if you're not yet very good at seeding hidden polyominoes. And what do I mean by that? Let's say this two goes this way or this way, and I could use different colors for this, let's just start this way. I've got this cell that can't be a one or can't be a two, so it must be at least three, and it has to keep growing from there. In this case, this three is touching to a three, that looks like an issue. So if I actually, without drawing this in, consider the two options, I need a hidden polyomino that's at least size three that goes this way or this way. But either of those options will touch to this number, so it has to be of at least size four, and this option is therefore removed because it can't grow any larger, and so you know this two has to come up. This hidden polyomino of at least size four is touching to a four, so it's actually now of at least size five. And we can put this in, that closes off this two. And yes, it's these edges. This three can come one to the right, but always has to take one up here, so I'll mark that in. And I think that's a good start. Let's see, what else do I see? Um, not as much in the lower right corner, but I've got the same kind of thing where this two can't go straight to the right and this two can't go straight to the left. So we've got some echoing logic to what we had up here, at least to draw these two edges. Um, the six in the corner is unlike the ones in the corner, but it is uh, full of space. So it must go with everything it can reach to, and that is squeezing in uh, this two now for sure to the right. This four comes over, this three comes over, this four comes over. This four has just enough space. The three has just enough space. That means this four has just enough space, and the two as well. Um, this four has to reach to this cell. That closes off this hidden polyomino. This five has to come over, the three then has to come over, and the two. We're cascading down, so we're getting these diagonals really interplaying with each other in this puzzle. I'm looking a bit in this space for a few reasons. I guess one thing I'm trying to see is like, can this five avoid making this uh, Y pentomino? And if it does that, it has to come up, and that puts this four in this way. But look at look at what sort of happens to it. Um, the 5 is pushed up in this mode, and that now leaves very little space for this 4. In fact, too little space for this 4. It only has three cells. So the cramping of these big numbers is giving me uh, a conclusion that I can't sort of dodge taking the cell in the middle, and I have to make this Y pentomino. That completes this 3 pentomino down here. If this four came and take the cell, that's fine for the cell, but I'd be leaving down two on their own. So I have to come down and take this this way, marks off this cell. This four always comes over at least one cell. Not seeing more right on this side. Let's come back to this corner because I think these twos and this one will be useful. So this cell here cannot be a one. Let me actually turn on shading to make it clear where I'm looking. I'm looking right now at this cell. It can't be a one and also can't be a two because it can't sort of just go one cell away. It will be touching a two. So it, it will be three or larger and it has to come down and connect to the cell. So actually now I know these uh, two join and knowing those join, I actually know then this two has to come this way. Uh, what if this joins to this three? Well, then it closes off, and now I have this space which has a cell that, that's going to want to be part of a hidden polyomino again, but it can't be a two because it's joining to this two, and that's causing issues. So I actually know that there's this edge. So this is touching to a one, two, and three. So it's at least size four, could be size five. This three comes down to this cell. Is that helping us out some? It's starting to now make the bottom of this grid more cramped. So we need to have this five and the seven work together. Notice if the five came over here, it's never gonna work with the seven, but the five has to take, and it doesn't matter which of these cells, the five has to take like these cells. 
and then the seven can take these cells, but the seven always, it looks like, has to take these uh, two uh, coming across. And so you could, you could mark in the five differently for like this, but um, yeah, uh, there's the, the seven always has to come across is something that I'm seeing uh, that actually marks off this four to have to come back this way. That now forces the five to come up the seven now has to take this and this. This four then has to take this coming up. This three and this four don't, sort of three plus one more can't come over to here. So this is the border. This four is just a square. This three is an L shape. Um, this cell here can be a one, but it can't be anything else right now. So I have to come up from the four to make that work. Uh, the seven still needs to take one more. That now moves this three over. It forces this to be a four, which is good in the top. This is a two. Uh, this is a successful seven. This is five. And this is now just going to be completing out these last edges. And we get through to this finish. So a good start with the Philomeno puzzle. And hopefully we can close this out now with this uh, Isodoku. The toughest thing with this may actually be just the the number entry uh, because we've got to do a lot of clicking on this because of this unusual grid shape. Uh, one thing to note will be about these long regions that have six in a row with two that stand out. So uh, these two digits have to then be the digits on the extremes. So we have five here and where I've got a seven in the cell, the seven goes there. Um, same thing on the side, the six is going to be up top. This is going to be an eight. And down here, I think I can put in a two, three note. Uh, well, actually, I can't do notes in this style. I can just write big numbers, but those numbers should get the point across. Um, the next thing to sort of think about is probably like these numbers got a lot of, I've got a ton of fives. The one thing I'm seeing is I have some rows that need to get fives. I'm trying to get like a five down here. But really what I have is a set of cells like these that are canceled out. Actually look across this whole row, like five is taken, 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 taken. This is the last space for a five. I now have to get a five over in this region. And this five coming down takes out these cells and these cells. So I have these two cells left for a five. And uh, I've got to get a five in this region. It's going to go into this cell. So this will come here, puts over here. So there is a five alone in this space. Let me sketch that out again. So this coming across means a five is in one of these two cells. That's going to take out the rest of this row. This five on the left takes out these cells. So the only cell left in this box is this five. This five working with everything below is going to cancel out to here. And we now have, it looks like, um, no, 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 no. So a five must be here. That cancels the last cells, puts in a five here. We now have a case where we have one, two across this edge. And that two is going to come all the way down here and resolve this space to be the three with the two. And this remaining edge has to be a six, seven. But we've got a six over to the right. So this is seven up top and six in this cell. Got a lot of sixes, so maybe we should look at them for a minute. And what's one of the more interesting places to look at for the six? I think we still need a six, like in this space, so six is in one of these three cells. Um, we've got them in all these rows coming down this way. So we've got to have a six actually coming into these cells, so that might be some of it. Um, so we can eliminate this cell as having a six. And working from the top, oh, it, it's right. I should just <laughs> look at the top row, um, six and seven. So this six is going to help us a bit because this six eliminates this cell. We said we eliminated these cells from the six already there. So six is one of these. But note across this row, which already has a six there, we need to get a six placed. So the six must be in that spot. Uh, do we have more we want to do with any of these numbers? Let's actually look at other. So like I have a seven here, and so a seven needs to be in these cells. That eliminates these, eliminates this. We still need a seven 
in this row coming this way. We actually also need a six in that row still, and the six can't be here or here or here. Notice this six cancels these two cells, this six cancels this cell. So this is the last space for a six in that row that moves down the seven. I now need a four in the space and then a one, two to complete it. Um, to help me out, I actually have a three in one of these cells. <clears throat> it still gives me a fair number of options. So I'm not going to use it yet. <laughs> or not write it in the grid yet, but you know, there's stuff you'll eventually get from uh, this kind of progress. Let's look maybe down here at the remaining digits, which are one, seven, and eight. The seven now is forcing a seven into one of those two cells. This is one, eight, not yet resolved by these, although this eight sees two of the cells, so the eight must be here in the space. And there's not a lot of ones up top, so I think coming back to the top is probably useful and may come from, again, looking at these cells. So what do we have pointed at most? This eight comes over to here. So an eight is in one of these two cells, which means it's eliminating everything in this row. This eight from the right is eliminating everything there. So this is the only cell I see for an eight that's still left in that space. That now means if I'm coming off this row, looking this way, I have one, two, eight to go, and eight is over here, and the leftover digit of four is actually already known and can be placed. This is sometimes what's useful. This is easier on paper, I guess, because I can do much more with my notation, but let me just work off this four. Four is coming to the right, so if four is in one of these two cells, that sees into this row, moves up this four to this cell. Now, this is just a one, two cell, and I have a three here. Does that three give me anything? That three cancels over here. So I have a three in one of these two cells. That three now comes to the spot and says, this is a three. So this is now a four, eight pair. And it's leaving behind one, three, and seven in the last cells. So a seven is in one of these two. A one is in the remaining one. And I have two and four in these. And the four down below says a two is here and a four is here. That two comes all the way back over here and puts a two in this cell, which now finally clears some more of this out. It says we have a one and three in these cells, and that is going to move up this seven, moves up this three. Actually, that's not right. I have one and three here. Right? One and three have to be here, so this is still a seven. This is one and three. I'm getting confused by all the numbers, but uh, I think I've recovered. That's the only thing I needed to walk back. We sh should soon be able to place this seven, um, and that's because here it is. It can't be here, it can't be here, it can't be here, so it's got to be in that row. That now means looking this way, I have a seven in one of these cells. Uh, this cell is seen by that seven, so seven is down below here. That four then coming across has to be up top. And so now I have one, three, eight, which leaves behind a two, moving down an eight, moving up a one, which now puts in this three and this one. For sure, completing out this row is a two in the cell, completing out this row is a one, in this cell. This row is completed with a three and a two. This is completed with a four and an eight, and there's an eight to the right here, so we put these in. This row is completed with a one. We have three and four to go here, and four is up above, so this is three and four. This three now sets this is one and three. This is left over as one eight. This is left over as one eight, but there's a one up above here, so this is eight, one, eight. We have one and three in these spots. Three is pointing down to here, so one and three. Uh, this has to see uh, the last digit of eight, and this has to see a four. And there we are, we're through the last snow of winter. So a challenging puzzle to end a challenging series of these look back videos, but I think we did a smashing enough job across all of them. So thanks for your attention through the whole series and uh, look forward to what's to come next for Grandmaster Puzzles. We'll see you again soon.